Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today here on the Armed with Reason podcast brought to you by GVpedia. Today is actually our season one finale, which is sort of hard to believe. And Devin and I discussed some options for the final episode of our inaugural podcast season. But given the fact that it is April and we all are well aware of the impact that the mass shooting at Columbine High School had 25 years ago on us as individuals, but also on the gun violence prevention movement, we knew that this guest was exactly the person to help us mark this milestone. So today I am honored to introduce Zach Martin, who was a freshman at Columbine High School in April of 1999, and he's now in his 13th year teaching at Columbine High School. He educates juniors and seniors in social studies, world history, and psychology, and as a survivor, educator, and a father, he is deeply dedicated to the gun violence prevention movement. So, Zach, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's, a, it's an important topic, so happy to be here. So I don't I didn't want to do too much of the storytelling for you. Obviously, you are the person who can do the best job of letting us know what your experience was like on April 20th, 1999. So maybe you can share a little bit about that and how that has influenced your life's path. Yeah, sure. It's kind of a two-part question, so I'll kind of start with my experience that day and then uh, can kind of answer the second part about the impact that's had on my on my path. Um, you know, I look back on that day and it, it, you, you, it's now kind of a blur. I can't believe it's 25 years ago. Um, the things that kind of stand out in my memory is just kind of like a lot of um, being left with a lot of confusion and anger. Um are kind of the big emotional things that kind of stand, stand out from that day. As far as my experience that day, I was really blessed to be in about as safe a place as you could be that day while also being at school. So we were um, sitting in art class um, on a nice April day when the fire alarm went off and kind of in true, you know, high school fashion, trying to play it cool and not look silly in front of your friends. You kind of look around and see what everybody else is doing. Um, I remember some of the seniors talking about it being a senior prank. Um, it was that kind of time of year near the end of the end of the semester. Um, and so the reality didn't really start sinking in until um, a student ran into the class and then yelled like, this isn't a drill. And still at that point, still didn't sink in. You know, this was times before before school shootings were a thing that was in anybody's um, consciousness. So I uh, still didn't even click in then. And we kind of walked uh, out of the class, out the, the uh, exit. And that's when uh, the reality really started to hit um, as you started to see um, injured students exiting the building, um, supporting each other. You saw broken glass, um, hearing gunshots um, as students were starting to kind of stream out of the school. Um, and again, still at that point, nothing even remotely in your thought process was going to some sort of mass shooting that just wasn't wasn't a thing uh, in 1999. Um, and so as we're trying to gather information, we hear, we hear some people talking about a gang fight or um, something along those lines that also didn't make any sense and didn't compute uh, with my brain at that time. Uh, we kind of stood outside the school and waited um, until the uh, police arrived. And then we're notified that we were just supposed to get as far away from the school as possible. Um, my, my house was, is what the house that I grew up in is, is really right next to the school. Um, you can see it from the school. Um, I can see it from the classroom I teach in. And so, um, we actually had to kind of like fence hop to get to my house, but um, some of the some of the students that I was with in that class and I made our way to our house, and that kind of became um, became kind of a, a spot where students who knew me. Uh, I had a senior; uh, my sister was a senior at the time. A lot of her friends, we all kind of like congregated there because it was the closest house, the closest safe place. This was a time before cell phones, um, and we just started 
calling um, and students would call, you know, kids would call their parents to let them know they were safe. Um, and so it became kind of this safe base um, for the rest of the day because the, the rest of the afternoon kind of unfolded. And so when I look back on my day, that was scary. It was confusing, but the kind of the, the worst part of the day was my sister, like I mentioned, was a senior um, and she was in the choir room. And as she was trying to run out of the building, gunfire down the hallway forced them back into the class. And so she was barricaded in um, a closet for roughly six hours. And again, no cell phones, no idea. So the moment from kind of starting the clock from leaving the school to you know, getting home and then waiting hours upon hours, then you just start getting all the rumor mill stuff of what's happening with hostages and um, all of kind of the rumors that were taking place at that time and just trying to wait for uh, confirmation and hearing, you know, that your sister's all right. And so that's kind of the most, uh, the hardest part of that day for me personally um, in the sense that I, I feel very blessed. I think now I feel blessed at the time. I didn't feel quite so blessed. I just got to walk out. I think I had a lot of survivor guilt um, that kind of hung with me that my friends had, um, you know, were in different spots and had different experiences that day. But in retrospect, um, you know, that was, uh, that was the toughest part of my day um, was just kind of getting, waiting to get that call um, from my sister um, that she was, she was safe. So, um, we did get that call, and so that that obviously was again very lucky and uh, very blessed for that. Um, but that's kind of my experience from that day. Um, I think the second part of your question was kind of like how has it impacted my life, and that's a good that's a very good question and one that I kind of like reflect on and and think about myself. And I don't really know how to answer it um, because you know in a, in a very real way, we don't get to live two different, you know, realities and, and get to know who would I be without this uh, school shooting versus who I am today. Um, so I don't know what choices I would have made. I think it's hugely influential. I don't think there's been many days in my life since over the past 25 years, I haven't thought about it or um, impacted me in some form or fashion. Um, and I definitely think it's it's a reason why I'm back at the school teaching. I think it's a huge reason why I became an educator. Um, you know, I was I was a freshman, so we returned to the school the following year, and we're back in Columbine for the next three years. Um, and that was a really chaotic, hard time. We were kind of in the national spotlight, and everything we did was under a magnifying glass. And there was lots of different explanations as to why it happened. Um, and so that was a really chaotic time. And so you're dealing, you're dealing with the, the, the trauma of the shooting itself. You're dealing with the chaos of kind of the pressure and expectations and those types of things that are kind of thrust on you as living under the microscope. Uh, and then you have also the other reality of just being an awkward 14, 15, 16 year old trying to navigate, you know, the stress of being a high schooler, which is on in and of itself. Uh, let's be honest, it's kind of traumatic just being a teenager. So um, you have all of that. Um, and, and when I look back, it was the it was I kept falling back to kind of my my parents, my teachers and my coaches, my parents, my teachers and my coaches when you know, I was 24, 25 years old and trying to kind of figure out what I want to do in my life and who shaped me. That's where I kept coming back to. And I think it was the, my parents and my teachers and my coaches that provided that sense of safety. Um, oddly enough, Columbine itself became, for me personally, I don't think this is true for everybody, but um, the safe haven, the place where I felt most comfortable, safest, um, out of the, sh out of, uh, after the shooting, I think it was a lot of chaos and turmoil outside of the school, but, um, for myself and for many of my friends, this kind of became the, the spot that we retreated to. And, and when we were in the building and when we were in class and when we were in activities, that's when we, we got to be normal, which I think is what we were all just wanting to be was, was normal. Um, and that's kind of ripped away from you, but it also begs the question of kind of like what is <laughs> normal. Um, and, and so I think that influenced 
my desire to become an educator and play that role for other students um, and played into my decision and willingness to come back and teach at Columbine is kind of pay it back to this community that kind of literally and figuratively wrapped its arms around us and helped us kind of um, heal in a time period of, of total chaos and confusion and, and not knowing how to respond to a to a school shooting and, the, and then we did it by just kind of like turning in on each other um, and embracing each other is how I at least felt and so being back at the school is kind of like jumping back into being a part of my family and um, you know kind of maintaining that and trying to create that family environment for for current students who are struggling with their own with their own um, hardships. Yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize what you described with the survivor guilt and then feeling like you could be normal back at the school where this tragedy happened is very much a breakdown of what happens psychologically in war, right? So right. people leave the battlefields and go home and are like, I, I don't function very well here because the people I care about and really saw some terrible things with are there. And so they, a lot of them end up going back. So, uh, and I'm sure there's many other layers to it as well. But when I hear you describe that, and it, it makes a lot of sense, but is also hard to think about our students, whether they're elementary school or all the way up through post-secondary, having to live uh, in that world with that sort of guilt and then feeling the most comfortable or the most themselves back in a place where such a tragedy took place. Yeah. Uh, and also the the context of the timing of Columbine, right, before really before cell phones were used in a large scale, especially for kids and before text messaging for sure. And even before school districts had things like reunification centers, it really, a lot has changed in 25 years. <laughs> um, yep. I, and unfortunately it's a lot of it is simply because of we've had a lot more practice at these sorts of things. Uh, and then of course the impact of technology, but it is, it's important to keep that in mind because it really does create a different scenario from what we would experience today. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you never want, yeah, it's a, it's a tragedy that schools reflect war zones um, today and that that's, psychology is still similar. I think schools are places of warmth and safety and should be comfortable and should be places of, comfort and, and yeah and safety and where you retreat to feel you know welcome and belonging and never should be this place where where anxiety or worry is is created out of this sense of fear um or that you lose that sense of warmth and community out of vigilance you know out of hardening a school um so that's always that now that modern balance of trying to keep a school safe without losing that warmth and, um, and welcome atmosphere, um, is, is really, is a, is a sad state, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to kind of focus in on the impact afterwards, um, oftentimes in the discussion of gun violence, almost all of the focus is on those who die during the shootings and in the aftermath, their loved ones. And I think part of that is due to that's where the best data is. I mean, even now in 2024, like we have a firm count of the people who died during shootings, but not of injuries still. And so oftentimes we see less focus given on those who were shot, but then survive. And then there's almost no focus from what I've seen on those who have survived the traumatic events without being physically shot. But you still have to deal with that trauma going forward. And so I'm just kind of curious about, and you touched on it a bit before, but kind of the trauma going forward and even in a way going back to where the trauma 
happen, but at the sa same time in a place that's supposed to represent safety. And so I'm curious, like, what the psychological costs ha have been and, like, kind of what you've seen on the community, the costs that don't, don't necessarily show up on the day of, but emerge over years and even decades. Right. I think it's um, something that I think it's interesting. I, I, I spent some time with some, um, some young activists from, you know, March for Our Lives and all of a sudden felt kind of like the grandpa of, um, you know, of school shootings, unfortunately, kind of like years in advance. And I think things that kind of caught me off guard is the long, as kind of you, as you kind of alluded to, the long, the long arc of trauma. Um, I think post, you know, the immediacy after a shooting, there's lots of supports, there's mental health workers there, there's access to counseling. But really, I think a lot of people in the way it's even kind of oftentimes um, thought about even from a policy standpoint is like long term is a year, year after the shooting. Um, and then what we lose is kind of that long term perspective of, of everybody of, of trauma doesn't just follow a schedule and it doesn't follow a calendar and they're you know after the one year anniversary it's not like well you know we're we're past it um and so i know for myself personally i think if you had asked my 25 year old self i would have thought yeah i processed it everything is good to go and then my 35 year old self is dropping off my two-year-old daughter at daycare for the first time and walks past a lockdown drill sign, you know, in their, in their kinder, you know, in their, in their pre-K school. Um, and I think that was outside of maybe the 10 year, maybe not even the 10 year anniversary, but maybe the one year anniversary, the one of the most difficult psychological kind of moments um, for me was sending my own kids to school and confronting that reality that 25 well 20 years 25 years on this is still um not only a problem but a growing problem and one that is continuing and one that has been failed to be addressed and so I think that was a really big switch uh for myself and then I know a lot of my friends um it's been 20 it was really kind of around the 20 year mark that a lot of them were in a spot to process um the trauma and in a kind of, a, and seek that help. Um, and so I think from a, a trauma arc, we could do a better job of understanding that long-term impact of that. Um, and you, you know, you think about some of the, the shootings that take place in elementary schools and with younger kids, you, you're marking, if you're, if you're like definition of long-term trauma is one year or five years, that's, those students might be in fifth grade, you know, they're, and they're supposed to have processed that and, and now no longer need the supports from society um, set up for them. And so I think as we move forward, thinking about this kind of uh, this problem we have and thinking, unfortunately, kind of along the lines of, 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 of war and having supports long term um, for health, mental health supports and counseling and that type of stuff, regardless of where you are, is kind of a responsibility that um, I'd like to see society kind of take on um, a greater awareness and, and, and um, responsibility and kind of like as the old guy going through and, you know, marching down that road uh, ahead of people, that's kind of looking back something that I don't think I anticipated 10, 15 years ago was the need for additional supports um, along that. And I think that just really speaks to the power of the impact of, of these types of events. Yeah. And to kind of even expand on that for a moment, when you look at um, communities where it's not necessarily like one mass shooting, but mm -hmm. like a daily toll of shootings, yep. where like with one event, as hor horrible as that event is, there's still the potential for a healing process afterwards over years, decades, but if your neighborhood has shootings every week, month, year, mm -hmm. like that, I don't think that healing process even becomes possible. And particularly if you're a kid growing up in that environment, 
like even if you yourself aren't shot, that's still got to have massive consequences going forward. Absolutely. Thank you. That I, That's a hugely important point. Thanks for bringing that up. I absolutely agree with everything you just said. Zach, I, I know we've said this a couple of times already. It is really hard to believe that it's been 25 years already since April of 1999. I, to me, Columbine was, lives in my memory sort of like September 11th or the day that everything was shut down for for covid right like there's there's sounds and smells and i was in 8th grade and it was april break and i was watching the news coverage and i was like i was so confused because as you said earlier this this just wasn't a typical thing for us and i wonder if you can tell us now you started to before talking about the difference between, you know, like the year anniversary and then dropping your a child off at daycare off at school, which I can certainly empathize. I think I think I have like a nanosecond of a moment every time I watch my daughter get on the school bus where, I'm, you know, like, oh, and I tell her I love her, you know, like it's just that and, and you don't even recognize it necessarily all, all the time, but it is just it's there. Right. But 25 years being a long time in some ways and a short time in others, can you tell us a little bit about how you feel looking back at what's happened in the world of gun violence and in gun violence prevention since your freshman year of high school? Um, sure. Um, I think it's a very, it's, it's an interesting reflection you know I think I got to talk about a little bit about coming back here and feeling like this was my safe place uh, and that we kind of unified together I think that potentially is different today and I can't speak for others today I can only kind of hypothesize where my my response but you know in 1999 the, after the shooting we I think we felt like it was a natural disaster like something that was unpredictable. Um, you couldn't prevent it. It was kind of a one-off flash in the pan type of event. Nothing in my mind in 1999 would have made me think that there would be a continued epidemic of these types of shootings. And so, and I think in for many of us in our confusion and in our anger, we had not really no place to kind of channel that. Um, and so I think we healed by coming together and kind of trying to resolve that. And certainly we all have experienced and many of us have different forms of, of, of responding to that trauma. But I think in large part, we came together as a, uni uh, as a unified community. I would imagine today I would feel very different. I think that confusion and anger would be um, directed. I don't think that there would be much confusion of like, what's the problem here? And why did this happen? You know, I think students go to school today with a very sad reality in the back of their mind that it's not an if, it's a when, and they prepare for that. And I think you see that in the way that students respond to school shootings. It's like, I've thought about this. I've written essays on it. I've researched it. I know exactly. I've, I've, I've played out in my mind that if this happens to me, how will I, not only what will I do in this moment, but what might I do and respond afterwards in a way that wasn't uh, an issue in 1999. And so I think that speaks to kind of the lack of movement in, in creating safer gun laws and um, taking steps towards, um, you know, common sense ways to keep, you know, guns out of, out of the, out of the wrong people's hands um, and the lack of, you um, you know, change over 25 years. Um, I would imagine if if it happened to me today as a high schooler, I would be um, filled with anger. And the unfortunate side effect of that is then it's divisive. Um, and I don't think you get the same opportunity that we had where we felt like it was an unpreventable once in a lifetime type of deal. I think that would be very different today. Um, and that anger would be directed um, in different ways, which I'm, I'm incredibly proud um, and in awe of, of, 
you know, the Parkland students from March for Our Lives and what they, how they've um, taken leadership and responded. Um, it's super inspiring um, and, and, and it's incredible um, what they've been able to do and accomplish. And so I think that kind of speaks to the, to the lack of movement over the last 25 years. And that was really a frustration when I realized, you know, I, to be perfectly honest, I'd say right after Columbine, I felt like, who am I? I'm an individual. What can I change? Or people have tried and nothing's happened. And the, you know, the gun lobby is too powerful. And if it hasn't happened now, how's any change going to, and I haven't seen, you know, and, and fall into that kind of like typical apathy. Um, and I'm really proud of the Parkland kids for not following that same kind of trap. Um, and then I think it was that day that I kind of confronted dropping my kids off that you kind of re reignited that fire of like, if there's any way that speaking or using my story or my experience can do anything, then, you know, then let's go. And that's, that's an important responsibility uh, and kind of change that. And, and so I'm hoping that some of the change that we've seen in recent um, years with the signing of the Safer Community Acts and some of the um, state level changes that we're seeing is is definitely not enough, but a sign of potential change of movement. Um, you know, moms demand action are doing incredible things um, and hopefully starting to get some change. And that's inspiring. But it, looking back at the last 25 years is incredibly frustrating and infuriating um lack of 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 political will uh on on what i think should be an important social topic and political um responsibility for for leadership so i don't i can't really remember what the question was <laughs> but i hope in some form or fashion that answered it yeah absolutely and i mean devin's from oklahoma i'm here in connecticut and so for different reasons, you will, f you probably won't find two people that see different ends of the spectrum, but share your frustration. Uh, you know, Devin can tell stories about some of the laws coming to be in Oklahoma that are really just will leave your head spinning. <laughs> and for me living, you know, 20 or so minutes from Newtown, what happened here on the state level afterward, but then watching the endless amounts of cowardice down mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. after uh, really are a reminder that things not only move at a, a snail's pace when it comes to pretty mundane topics, but also when it comes to things that are responsible for saving people's lives. So yep. we, we hear you for sure. Yeah. And um, I have one question I had that came up when you're talking about like the 25 years and such and you teach psychology so <laughs> that would yeah. be useful um do you have any advice on how to prevent burnout and like this is something that i've personally even though i'm not a survivor have struggled with with doing it for 10 years where it's just looking back and it's like well not much <laughs> and yet we keep having all these shootings and so it's just a perpetual bang head against wall sort of thing and within the gun bonds prevention movement more broadly like i know dozens of people who were in this space a decade ago or when i started getting more nationally involved like eight or so years ago that have just moved on because they just can't anymore and so any advice for dealing with burnout? Um, I don't know if I have great advice. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's such a great question and it's so hard because you see not like to your point, snails pace change and even backsliding and, and, and legislation that is even in the opposite direction. And so I totally get, and I guess I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't judge anybody that, does experience burnout or or is dedicated time and then gets frustrated uh, i guess you know it's cliche or maybe easier said than done but that you know i think hope is huge and i think hope is going to need to uh remain for any change on this to take place i think it's what has to fuel and, and keep people's tanks 
filled when there is no tangible reward, right? I mean, it'd be nice to have work pay off with huge rewards and things you can point to um, and tangible uh, moments that kind of, um, you know, justify in your own mind the sacrifice and the hardship and all the things you go through um, for something that's important and a goal. And in this case, in this space, it's even more difficult and, and super important because it's people's lives we're talking about. And so when that's not there, it becomes super frustrating. And I totally get that. I think I was kind of in that space for a long time. And then kind of that hope or, yeah, I, I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, a motivating hope that there will be change and whatever and however long it takes is is important. Um, is kind of, you know, my best message. Me personally, I would say my cup was filled meeting the Parkland kids in the in March for Our Lives. Uh, really, kind of filled up that cup of hope and um, and was super impressive. Uh, met with students from Sandy Hook, um, and that was also incredibly powerful, uh, powerful experience and motivating for me. And so, talking with survivors, talking with uh, people in the space has been very motivating. I always leave more motivated than I, I was. So if I ever need a jolt, it's kind of like reaching back out to people in that space to kind of, you know, steal from their enthusiasm uh, might be a little selfish, but um, yeah, I, do, I, think, I think that hope has to be there. Otherwise it's very easy to fall into apathy or um, that jaded mindset. And then without that, the political grind and the system has kind of done its job of making it difficult and slow um, and grinds that out. So I don't, I wish I had like a technical, like psychological answer for you and say, by the textbook, here's how you prevent burnout. But um, yes. I don't. Eat these three foods to prevent burnout. Yeah. Get more <laughs> sleep. That seems to be the answer to everything. Uh, so there you go. Yeah. Um, so one of the experiences that I had uh, back in 2019, GVpedia hosted a conference in Denver to mark the 20th anniversary of Columbine. And during that conference, which had about 150 survivors, advocates, leaders from across the country, the fire alarm went. Mm. And the and at the same time, the air conditioning, switched on, which created this thump, 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 thump kind of sound. And many of the older survivors and even like some of the Parkland students kind of took it in stride, um, which was impressive. But there is a couple contingents of students from other schools that did not. And those were students from schools that had active shooter drills. And it was telling to see like the difference, like, and just seemed to stem from whether or not they had active shooter drills. So my question is, does Columbine have active shooter drills? And if so, what's that like, particularly given the history at the school? Right. Um, we have, we don't call them active, active shooter drills. So they're called lockdown drills, which I'm not a safety school safety expert. So they might be technically two different types of drills. Um, so we don't, we don't call them active, active shooter drills. We do lockdown drills, which is for kind of like an active shooter situation. Um, it varies from year to year um, and is different. They are cognizant of kind of our past here at Columbine. So I think they treat them a little bit differently than they do at other schools and give us a little bit more leeway to kind of uh, individualize it and, and take into account um, the experience here. And I think are maybe a little bit more receptive to doing things differently. Like this year, we just had to watch a video rather than go through the whole lockdown drill and process, um, but we've definitely practiced kind of lights out, locked doors out of sight. Um, you know, in my 13th year doing it personally, now, you know, I kind of walk my way through and do my deep breathing and 
can kind of focus on my task and my kids. So I have those kind of like coping mechanisms of checking in on your senses and that you kind of figure out for yourself um, over time uh, to kind of work through it. I know for some of my colleagues, like I'm not the only um, teacher that was uh, uh, there that day that's teaching. I think there's now five or six of us here. Um, and so they all have their different um, experiences. I know some colleagues take that day off um, as it's just something that's, you know, uh, too, too uncomfortable. Um, it's, you know, again, it's that unfortunate reminder of the reality that we're in that is brought back up to the conscious awareness of this is the reality and so potentially common that we have to do a drill. Um, and so I don't, you know, I don't like that. Um, in that terms, but here personally, in our experience, you know, I think they do a decent job of trying to be cognizant of our past while also meeting their mandated responsibilities. Um, I've heard of active shooter drills in other schools that sound much more kind of like uh, trauma inducing than the ones that we experience here. Um, and I think that begs the question of where's the research behind that. Um, but again, I'm not like a school school safety expert that would you know, want to, or feel comfortable speaking to it, but that's just my personal experience. Yeah. And have you seen an impact on the students over your years of teaching as like the lockdown drills have become more of a thing? Because like when I was in, well, I didn't go to high school technically, but even when I was like in middle school, like we didn't have anything like that with the, if the fire alarm went off, it was a fire drill and you go outside, which is the opposite of what you're supposed to do for a lockdown. <laughs> right. And like, and to your point, like I've definitely seen those where like, they'll have like fake ammunition fire where it sounds like it's real. There'll be mm -hmm. like fake blood and such. And it's like, what are you trying to accomplish here? Right. <laughs> and like, there's also kind of the point that there really isn't any solid evidence that these help when those situations come out, like maybe teaching first aid to students would, but like the drills themselves. And also you're very likely teaching the shooter themselves in those drills. And so it doesn't, it seems like kind of a grifting industry that can almost like, it's only going to add to more trauma without actually imparting like actual safety. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the struggle is figuring out what what do we do to keep kids safe and what makes sense and what justifies the means in the process. I think with those drills, it's, it's hard. I don't, you know, I don't personally agree with, I think it, I think it again is more indicative of I, I, I see it as more indicative of like, this is a, a reality that we're trying to solve by teaching our, this is how we're solving it. Like, this is our part of our solution. We won't pass laws. We won't try to, um, you know, make it more difficult to gain access to the weapons of war that's being used in our school, but we'll take time out of the day to remind kids that this is the reality and this is part of our solution. I think that uh, often upsets me <laughs> it's like we people argue about let's do everything we can to keep kids safe and let's drill and we're willing to you know to your point of going to super lengths to make it as real as possible but god forbid we'll you know take any action politically um in the legal system and so i see kind of like speaking out of two sides of the mouth um and and so i think that's that's for for me frustrating um and then you know kids today definitely come in with a very strong awareness that this is their reality i think it's in the back of their minds like i mentioned it um they've been doing actor you know lockdown drills and active shooter drills since preschool so it's every year multiple times a year this is this is your reality kids and this school isn't as safe as you you think it is and we know it's not because we're going to do this drill and for that as an educator always just feels like a violation of this space that you're trying to work so hard to create a loving, welcoming, warm space. Um, and so it's hard to kind of rationalize those two things. Yeah. I mean, the kind of basic message that's sent with them is like, 
we're willing to do everything to keep our kids safe, except the stuff that actually works and might inconvenience gun owners. Like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, it's it's a it's a reactive measure rather than being proactive, right? And then we're putting the the responsibility on our children and teachers to do the right thing, which we taught them in the lockdown drill, rather than our gun owners and the grownups yeah. in society to do. Yeah. The right and then thing. the conversation after can be, you know, who locked their door, who didn't lock their door, who you know, right. barred the door with their body versus, right. um, you know, more larger contributing factors. So, right. We have one final question for you today. And that is, what would you want anybody listening to this podcast to remember about Columbine? Whether it's something from 1999 or when you first started working there as a teacher or even from today? Um, I think there's I, I, there's the kind of the current, you know, call it like I, I love this place. This place is home. Um, I think it did a phenomenal job of kind of recovering and um, supporting us students. I don't know if everybody feels that way, but that certainly uh, was my experience. I think. I think like looking kind of over the 25 year scope and realizing like people that go through this can still live a rich and full, meaningful life is a huge lesson for others who go through a school shooting because there's definitely times in the immediate math aftermath and years afterwards where that we're being normal or feeling like you're broken can become a reality and define that for you. And I think, you know, I'm incredibly proud of um, the, all of the students who went through this tragedy are, are, are wonderful humans are incredibly um, put together, healthy adults. And so you can experience this, you can go through trauma and you can still live a meaningful and full life. And so reminding survivors of that and making sure they understand that, that there is hope. Um, I think, you know, uh, going forward and, and as far as like one of the most important things of coming out of Columbine is that, um, is I just look around at all my friends that, that we went through this together and, and what wonderful people and lives they're leading and parents they are becoming and reminding other young people that are experiencing gun violence that that doesn't have to you know that a single day an event doesn't have to define you um it's a part of you and it can influence you uh but it you can use that and still continue to find your your meaning and your uh calling in life and i think that's an important message for all of all survivors to hear um because there's some dark days where maybe that doesn't feel possible or you question that as well and you look around at the violence and and wonder if if you're the you've fallen victim beyond kind of redeemability or the ability to kind of control your own life and and i think um i think students from columbine have shown that they can um that you can do that and so i think that's that's important absolutely and you mentioned earlier about having no tangible reward in in certain scenarios right whether it's uh, fighting for safer a safer world based on you know making good choices when it comes to access to guns uh, but there is no question for me as as a mother in particular but also as somebody who believes so strongly in the value of education that your tangible reward every day is those kids in your classrooms. And I see conversations happening all over the country and the world, for that matter, about teacher contracts. And, you know, we, they, we can only give them 2% raises, not 4%. Like, those people jump in front of bullets for your children. Like, if they want for it, give them 10%. Give them whatever they want. Like, it, like I can't even believe we're having these conversations. So I I know you stated you can't see what your life would look like uh, without having been at Columbine in 1999. But I am 
grateful that you chose to take the path to become an educator because you are shaping young minds and they will leave that school and they will remember the things that you taught them. Maybe not about modern European history, <laughs> but but certainly about life. So that is a, a wonderful feeling to to have as somebody who certainly can feel that hopelessness. And I just want to thank you and commend you for, for all the work that you do every day. It makes endless amounts of difference. Well, thank you so much. That's, that means a lot and is greatly appreciated. And so thank you. Um, can I throw one more of course. thing in there? I think I'm circling back to Devin's um, point. Like I, I can only speak to kind of the, the mass shooting um, school shooting that's often sensationalized and captured in the headlines type of experience. But uh, I think I, I would feel remiss if I didn't point out just kind of the epidemic of gun violence and who's who's most impacted as far as marginalized communities and kind of, you know, the school mass mass shootings um, get a lot of the attention. Um, but I think we also need to discuss and focus on, I'm sure you guys are uh, um, doing it, um, but just um, recognizing that that problem, um, the gun violence is oftentimes unreported and unsensationalized and that um, I didn't want to come off or, 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 or shift the spotlight so much that it's just this, um, hey, there it is, um, just this uh, focus as far as when we define gun violence, I think a lot of people's minds go to these, you know, Columbine types of shootings um, and just kind of mentioning or drawing the attention back that the, that the reality is that statistically, I think it's most likely that you're going to be impacted and it's those, those less um, covered shootings. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I always want to throw that in during these types of interviews and make sure that I, I give it due justice and, and, and recognize it and kind of um, make sure that uh, it's known that I'm speaking to a certain type of gun violence and that's my experience. So. Yes, absolutely. Here at GVPDO, we try to focus on lifting up voices that don't always get a platform and also understanding that there's not only gun violence that happens uh, in communities every day, but a lot of people who die from gun violence in this country are because of death by suicide mm -hmm. and that we cannot overlook either of those, even Thank if you. that's not where a majority of media time is focused. So we we actually have some, we're lucky to have in the space some really dedicated individuals who want to tell the story and tell the story well of gun violence that happens in communities every day um, rather than either misreporting it or not reporting it at all. Right. Yep. And then- there are some survivors. We actually interviewed one a couple of weeks ago who their life's mission is to say, hey, I'm a survivor. This is my experience with the media. I want to make sure that other folks don't have this same experience. Wonderful. Yeah. And so making, you know, that that's what fills their cup, so to speak, to use your term. So <laughs> great. Um, and well, you thank you for your guys' work so much. And I course. appreciate you. And uh, admire you, admire you guys you certainly are a school safety expert uh and when you start zach martin school safety consulting give us a call we would like to be a part of your launch so you oh, well can, i you plan to be a teacher do so i don't know when that's gonna happen all right fair enough fair enough yeah. you have enough on your plate i'm sure but um thank you so much again and uh we we look forward to hearing more about the the great work that you're you're doing and uh, we really appreciate you appreciate you as well thank you so much for your time and this conversation